everybody. How's everyone doing? Everyone's good? What's dessert? Chris, what's dessert? I had ice cream. Where's your ice cream? It was fish food flavored. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's the brand. It's the pH. Oh, with the fish. Oh, fish with the, the yeah. pH. <laughs> you know, I know. <coughs> what, what's the relevance? I, I just ate it for breakfast. <laughs> oh, you had ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> yeah? Is it good? Okay. Uh, all right. They all have an interesting breakfast today. All right. Uh, any questions about anything we covered last time? Easements one. Anything? Okay. So today we will continue talking about easements. And we're going to continue one thread about how an easement can be in existence without being in writing. Um, just a mini review. Uh, where did I leave up last time? Are you up or is he up? No, I don't know. I'm just kidding. All right, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we had the ice cream. We should be ready to go. So, what's the difference between an easement and a license? Um, you are so honest. Okay. From Bucket. <laughs> What? Go, all, right, all right, let's go back there. I'll, I'll keep it honest. All right, what, what's the difference between an easement and a license? The main difference. An easement and a license, the main difference. Good. What's another difference, uh, Matt? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 Maritza, what's another difference? <laughs> Between an easement and a license, what's another difference? Mm -hmm. What's the main difference? Oral versus oral written. Yes, yes. Licenses are oral, they're spoken. Easements are written. But, uh, Katie, is it true that an easement has to be in writing? No. Why not? Yeah, what's an implied easement? <clears throat> Well, more broadly, what's an implied easement? Good. Okay. Yeah, you're giving me one one type of it. So broadly speaking, an implied easement means the easement's not in writing, but courts will find that an easement in fact exists. Courts will create it as a matter of law, right? And there are a number of different ways to get an implied easement. Um, Susan, am I going your way or am I going the other way? I don't remember. So, all right, I'll, I'll go back. To, I'll go back there. Okay. All right, Bill, you're up. So, what are some of the different ways an implied easement can exist? Uh, there's the quasi. Yeah, quasi easement. Well, what, what does that mean? Uh, Existing use, okay. existing use. This is kind of like an estoppel argument, but not really. It's saying, listen, I've been doing something for you know a long time. I might not have reached the point of adverse possession, but there's some sort of prior use that would imply that I can I can use this road. Um, so this would be a, a quasi easement. The example of this is the sewage case, uh, the one we did last week. Saying, listen, I've been pumping my waste underneath your land for a long time. Uh, I haven't quite done it long enough to hit, trigger the average possession statute, but it's been long enough that I've been continually doing this. Courts will apply it. So, so basically, the courts will say, based on continuous usage, uh, there'll be an implied easement. Okay. That one is probably the uh, most widely accepted one. Okay. Now, John, what's another way you can get an implied easement? That is an easement that wasn't in writing. Uh, easement is by necessity. Okay. What's that? Um, Good, right. So we'll talk about this in a lot more detail with the next case, but, but broadly speaking, if you really need to use a piece of land, if like you absolutely have to, courts will actually give you an easement. And that has a couple 
uh, uh, implications. Um, first, it gives you a property right that you didn't have before. And second, it takes away a property right from the landowner. If you talk about a bundle of sticks, you just took one stick from him, gave it to you. Okay, that, that's kind of a big deal. Courts don't like doing that because it's very open-ended. Um, uh, Chris, what's, what's another way, and I think you mentioned before. Prescriptive even. Prescriptive What does that mean? Uh, kind of like adverse possession, but it's applied to the use of land instead of possession. Right. Exactly. And you have to have all, pretty much all the elements now. Yes. So it's called prescription or prescriptive easement. It's called different things. Don't call it adverse possession because it's not. It's like adverse possession, but slightly different. Adverse possession, like Chris said, refers to living on the land <coughs> continuously for X years. Prescription means using the land. Um, it's like adverse possession, but don't call it that because it's, that's not how it's referred. So you can call it prescriptive easement or prescription. Okay? Okay, and let, let's also review a little bit of vocabulary just to make sure we're all on the same page. Dominant tenement and servient tenement. Um, uh, Alvaro, yeah. in the context of an easement, right, which is which? The dominant would be the landowner where the person getting the easement would be the servant. So that, say that more clearly. I think you're on the right track, but just, just repeat that clearly. Dominant would be the, the actual landowner. Which landowner? There are two landowners. Well, uh, so the person that, who... That has the, the, the entire state. <laughs> No, Lance? So the kid walking across my yard and he creates an easement, he becomes the, uh, he becomes the, <clears throat> he's servient. No, 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 okay. Uh, uh, I'm glad you said that. The one who makes use of the land. We're not talking about people. Tenement is land, so, so be very careful. Okay. We're not talking about people. What are we talking about? Property. And who owns the property? Okay, so, so how would you define the dominant tenement? Then you were right, but just, just okay. tweak a little bit. The dominant tenement is the one who makes use of the land. Right. So it's the land. Um, it's it's the land that that receives a benefit. Broadly stated. So if there's an easement saying I can cross across your land, the land that benefits it is a person who lives on the land it can cross over. And then the easier one's a serving tenement. Which one's that, Lance? That's the person of the land making use of the easement. We makes use of the easement. Um, Think how to phrase it. Land that's appertenant, connected land that makes it makes. Well, appertenant just refers to geography. It okay. doesn't have to be. So it's uh, yeah. How would you how would you describe it simply? There's one that receives a benefit, and what how would you describe the other one? Servings, the guy with the chickens, bring them to the lake. No, Mary. He's the one that's burdened. Yes, that bears the benefit. I mean, about burden, burden. Sorry. Myself. No, that's right. Thank you, Mary. So, remember, tenement is land. Do not tell me that the dominant tenant is a person because it's not. It's a piece of land. Okay? And, and, and you're, both, you're both right. So, the dominant tenement is a land that's receiving the benefit, and the serving tenement is a land that's bearing the burden. So, in the case of the chickens, the serving tenement will be the land on which the chickens are being watered with the lake. The dominant tenement would be the land where the chickens normally live. And the guy who owns it happens to be living on the dominant tenement, but it's not in his name. Okay? Uh, one more term. Um, uh, so, hey, what's, what's an easement? What's the difference between easement and gross and easement appertenant? What's the difference? In gross, in gross is when, like, the easement, um, it's in a person. Like, um, right. Like, let's say a farmer. Like, um, like, the farmer has easement, even if he's used to another piece of land or something. Right. That's exactly right. So the easement and gross, the benefit is in a person. There's not a dominant tenement. So here, dominant tenement, that doesn't exist for easement and gross. The normal one is easement appurtenant. Uh, uh, Alex, so what, what's the easement appurtenant? <coughs> Good. And which plot of land? What do we call that piece of land that's benefited? No? It's right up there. Good. So with the, with the easement at pretendant or pertinent, depending on how you want to say it, the benefit's in the land, and that's called the dominant tenement. Okay? Everyone with me with these, these terminologies? Just, I'm teaching future interests in, uh, in Property 1 today and 
with all this contingent remainder to investor remainder, all those horrible terms which I'm sure you've all forgotten, but the terminology is sometimes the trickiest part, just remembering what's what. So that's a little quick summary for you guys. Yes, the benefit. They're one and the same, the easement, No, uh, to be more precise, with an easement appurtenant, the benefit is in the land. To, to, to say it more clearly, does that, that make sense? The easement appurtenant is not the same thing as a, as a dominant tenement. Because you could say with an easement appurtenant, the benefit is in the land. And then, I'll say it like this. The benefits in the dominant tenement, and the burden, oops, the burden is in the serving tenement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, oh, I was only focusing on one of them. Okay. okay. Everyone with me so far? All right. So let's talk about then the um, the Athen case. I think this might be the only case we have from, the only big case we have from Texas this year. No, we have that air conditioning case. I think it might be two or three cases from Texas. Because uh, I know you all care. This is actually Justice uh, Brewster of the Texas Supreme Court. He wrote the opinion. Uh, it's the only time I'll talk about the Texas Supreme Court in a while. Oh, um, one, one final, one note. Let me tell you. Uh, we have a, a guest lecture, and actually you guys are very, very lucky. Um, so there's a slight change to the syllabus, which I'll highlight now before I forget. On, I think it's the 16th. Sorry. So you see class 25 on April 16th, right? We're going to have a special lecture. It's Justice Busby. He was just uh, appointed last year and reelected to the 14th Court of Appeals. Uh, he is a bright young uh, jurist in this state, he will be going very, very far. So he will be coming here to talk about uh, regulatory takings. Um, in particular, he'll be talking about this case, Severance versus Patterson. This is a Texas Supreme Court case from 2012. This is a really big deal. Uh, the, the, the facts were, after Hurricane Rita, there was a lot of erosion in Galveston, and a lot of the beach lines were moved back and forward. And the Texas Supreme Court considered how the easements would be uh, signed after these uh, after the shorelines moved. Uh, don't get too much into the facts now because it will make much sense, but this fits into kind of a broader doctrine of something called regulatory takings. Mm -hmm. So Justice Busby will be teaching that class on the, uh, 20, on the, on the 16th. Uh, you don't pay attention to me, pay attention to him because he's a lot, lot smarter than I am. He's a very good guy. I think, I think you'll enjoy it. So the reading is slightly modified. I added that one case. Okay, everyone got that? I try not to ever change a syllabus because I don't like it because people have expectations. So here you have roughly a uh, month and a half notice, so this shouldn't be too bad. So I know you'll do your readings a month and a half ahead, right? <laughs> I don't even. Okay, so back to uh, back to the, the case at hand. Okay, so let's, I like this, um, this diagram. Okay, so just a little bit of the background of the case as well. Um, this, this took place in you know, the early 20th century in Texas, um, probably in a very rural area. Um, does anyone have, and I asked this last semester, a conception of how big 2,500 acres is? Is that big or not big? I don't, I don't even know how big that is. Is that, because I mean, it looks here on this map like, you know, it, it's big, right? OK. Um, <laughs> well, it'd be nice. To have that, it'd be wonderful. Yeah, well, as long as you don't get trapped. So we have this big piece of land, right? And it's owned by a guy named Hill. And Hill starts chopping up various pieces of it. And he sells something to this guy named Othin. Um, Othin, according to the book, is wiry and tough, 5'5", five, five, 135 pounds. You can imagine a little, little, little Napoleonic thing going. Uh, he farmed cotton as a cat crash crop, uh, corn, hogs, and milo. You don't know what that is? Milo, milo, some sort of feed of some sort? Grain? I don't know. Uh, apparently, there was a lot of bad blood between the Athens and the Raziers. And this, this was kind of a long-standing feud. I guess when you live out in the country and they'll know where you get these feuds that develop, <laughs> neighbors just don't like each other. Um, so let's, let's walk through the transactions. And this, this animation, which I put, didn't put in the blog, I, I put this little diagram which shows it, but this animation will walk us through quickly. So... Uh, 
Uh, Allison? No. Allison, yeah? I, I, oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I, I forgot where I was. No, you're off. You're, uh, David, right? I, because I thought I went, okay. It's harder than you think, because I have to juggle every, where everyone is and where everyone's going around. Okay. So you're up, right? Okay. So let's walk through the transactions. What was the first transaction that uh, occurred in this case? The first sale. Okay. Good. So there was one hundred. So Hill sold a hundred acres uh, in eighteen ninety six. Okay. It wasn't initially sold to Razier, but for purposes of our uh, uh, analysis, it doesn't even matter. Okay. So Hill sold a hundred acres in eighteen ninety six. So that's that chunk. And you see that it borders right along Belt Belt Line Road. That's the main drag in that in that area. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, Stephanie, what was the second transaction that occurred in this case? The second transaction was that Hill gave 60 acres <coughs> that ended up in open tank. Okay, good. Okay. So the next transaction was he sold these 60 acres, right, in 1897. So it's roughly one year later. This was the by Razier. This was the by Othen. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and this diagram kind of misleading, is there's a lot of other land around. We don't know who those pieces were sold to. On this picture, they look like they're just green, but for purposes of your analysis, assume that someone else owns them, and that will be important later on, okay? So this was sold, and this was sold. Okay, fine. Um, Haley, what was the third transaction in this case? Uh, I think, yeah. So I think I think the 53 acres are sold first, or or, or what we'll consider it sold first. So Hill sold the 53 acres, right there, and that was in 1899. And who wound up owning the 53 acres? Okay. Yeah, Athens. Good. And then the next transaction, like you mentioned, was in uh, 1899. And who who wound up owning that? <coughs> Gross here, okay. So here we have the situation. And again, pretend that all this green is owned by someone else. If you, if you think it's just like this empty field, the problem becomes not quite as, as useful. So we have Mr. Often here, right? This is the main road. Assume he can't go north, assume he can't go south. Say someone else owns it and they have a fence, okay? For a number of years, he crosses a path. And the path cuts like this. Along here, across the 16 acres, <coughs> and here. He doesn't actually go onto the 100 acres. 100 acres has a fence. Was that Winnie the Pooh 100 acre forest? Anyway, so he crosses here <coughs> and walks right along this fence. He does it for a number of years. That's the only way he can get to the road, OK? But we have some weather problems. Uh, uh, Catherine, what, what happens here that, that changes the situation? Right. Does anyone actually understand what this means? I, I didn't quite. I, I assume there's some sort of flooding, but does anyone get what actually? Yes, sir. Well, I think the like the runoff of the water was going on to his crops. Uh huh. Or, and so he had to build a levee to block it from going on. Which is the oh, to the road to where they got it. The road up. So in other words, the water was flowing over his props here. He says, I don't want that, so he diverted it to this, to this path right here, right? Okay, in any event, he made a levee. The levee flooded the path. So this little yellow path became flooded. And it can only be traversed on horseback. I, lo I love that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's Texas, right? So what happens, uh, uh, Lily? Right, well, right, so, but what happened in court? Who sued whom? Right. And what, what did, what did he, what, what did Othen claim in his suit against Razier? Right, but what, what was the nature of his, of his suit? What did he sue for? Uh, 
more broadly, what, what was he trying to enjoy? <laughs> No. Let's go, my friend uh, Justin. What, what was he trying to sue for? He Good. Right. So what he was saying is he wanted the court to enjoin Razier from interfering with his easement. That's what he's saying. He wants an injunction saying, hey, stop interfering with my easement. Stop flooding water onto this path, right? Uh, did he have an easement? At least in the traditional sense. In the traditional sense, I mean, he had, he'd been traveling for a long time. I mean, was, we said at the beginning of class that the big difference between an easement and a license is a license is oral, and the easement's written. Did he have any kind of written easement? No. Right. So there's no written easement. So this tells us we have to start thinking about implied easements, and that goes back to um, the the items we mentioned here. How can we get an implied easement? Those are the different. Uh, methods by which we can get an implied easement. So, um, is that Kylie? What are the arguments that he raises about why... <laughs> Deserved it. So what are the arguments raised about why... Um... <laughs> it's, that's why I record classes. What are the arguments among these three? Which are the arguments that that often can raise about why um, why there's implied easement, Catherine? Uh, I mean, uh, Kylie. A little bit louder, please. Okay, right. And what what else does he raise from from the from these possible options? And what else, really? Yeah, he, he kind of throws the entire kitchen sink at it, which makes sense because there's a lot of overlap between the quasi-easement and prescription because it talks about how long you've been using it. And there's also some overlap between the necessity and the quasi because if you really need it, you've been doing it for a long time. They really overlap. So he has to raise really all, all three of these possible claims, okay? So what did the trial court hold then, uh, uh, Muhammad? Um, they said that he did not have a Why? Uh, Wait, you did say he did or didn't? I didn't hear what you said. The trial court. The, the trial court? Uh, it's not what I have. Uh, what do you think? Um, uh, oh, you're not in the right seat. Oh, you are. Oh, you are. Oh, oh, you're not in the right seat. Okay, Matthew. Did, what did the trial court hold? Right. Okay, good. So, sorry, people. Oh, you're two seats over. Okay. So the trial court said, yeah, he had an easement by necessity. This was the only way. I go back to the picture. This was the only way that he can get to the main road. You can't get there any other way. Okay. And he ordered Athen to put the road back in the condition it was before. Now, as my friend said before, what that means is he has to probably start flooding his crops. I mean, Chris, if you tell the guy you can't build a levee there, what would that mean for his crops? I mean, that means it's a flood his crops? Or build, flood some yeah, other land? Go hydroponic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I mean, the water's got to go somewhere, right? The water's got to go somewhere. So if it can't go on this mushy road, it's got to go somewhere else. So unless he starts doing hydroponics and, you know, plants the crops in the, in the water, makes a pig bath, I don't know. But he's got to put it somewhere. Court of Appeals reverses. And so there's no easy by necessity, okay? So in order to understand the, um, the holding of the Supreme Court of Texas, we have to get one concept down. It's the idea that people won't screw themselves over, broadly stated. If you're Hill, right? And we'll walk through this again. If you're Hill, uh, here it is. You are not going to landlock yourself. Everyone knows what I mean when I say landlock? If you are Hill, you are not going to box yourself in, like, like this picture in the, uh, in the textbook, like this. It's presumed that no one would ever do this himself, would, would, would sell one, two, three, and four, but leave five for himself. The law presumes that no one will ever do that, because that's really dumb, because you basically make your land worthless. Um, 
uh, Blackstone says, if a man grants me a piece of ground in the middle of his field, at the same time, tacitly and plyly gives me a way to come across it. I may cross it. So in other words, if someone does this, we assume he leaves five for himself, because otherwise it's just stupid. So let's, let's consider this in the context of the, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Hill case. And again, assume that all the stuff in green was sold to someone else, right? Just assume it was, and factor that it probably was. So, um, uh, Ozer, what I want to do, and I'll probably call on several people for this, so you're up eventually. Warning. So what I want to do eventually is go through this and see at what point Hill will be landlocked, okay? Okay, so the first few are going to be easy. And again, remember, assume all the green stuff is sold to someone else. At this point, after the sale of the 100, would Hill be landlocked? Right, at this point he's fine, right? Because all he sold was um, that 100 acres. And we're still good there, okay? Now, Othin purchases this portion. Can Othin still get to the main road, um, uh, Nikki? Right, right, he can cut right across here. Okay? But then the problem occurs. This one. Or is there? Um, uh, uh, Lee? Yeah. So after the sale of this 53 acres, can Othin still get to the main road? Yes, and you can the same way. Right, yeah. He can cut across here, no problem. He's not bothering Mr. Ross here. But, uh, Craig, what happens here? At that point, he can't. That's the point where he's screwed. That's the point where he can't. Because that would require him to go either north or south, and we don't know if he can do that. Before he had a direct pathway to the road, he doesn't have that anymore. So, um, so James, once we know that this road is blocked, what do we... I don't mean to pick on you, but I'm sorry. Oh, you're done. Okay, Sean, Sean, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. So, Sean, what... I, I, I don't... What happens when this easement is applied? I mean, what happens when, what happens when you have a situation like this? What do we assume happened? What do we assume happened when Hill made this final transaction? That he's still on the way out. That he's still allowed. What did he do specifically? What did he do? What did Hill do when he sold that last bit of land to Razier? What if he never said such a thing? She said it. What is it? It's implied. It never has to be written. There's no reason why this needs to be written down. Because it's simply infer. We infer. Everyone knows the difference between imply and infer because he believes it wrong all the time. If I am making an implication, I am implying. If you're receiving that, you infer it. Okay? So don't, don't get them mixed up. He implied an easement, and the course will then infer it. He will say, listen, I'm not going to landlock myself in there. I'm going to make sure that I have a way out of my own land, because that's, that's pretty stupid not to. Okay? Can you click on the YouTube video? What, what is it? I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it later. Okay. I'll do it later. Okay. So basically, and this concept won't come up too much, but we just assume that a person won't landlock themselves in. Okay? The only way he could have gotten that. So that's how we do the implied easement by necessity. But the tricky part is, was it actually necessary for this to be the only way across? You know, if we're looking at it, it's like, oh yeah, piece of cake, we can cross here. Well, why couldn't he do this? Well, why couldn't he do this? Uh, uh, Sean, why couldn't he go north or south? I'm real hungry. I mean, I don't even know why. It's yeah. Good. What do you think, Sean? Uh, I assume that land was owned by the Jews. Why couldn't he negotiate an easement with them? 
Why couldn't he offer to buy a right of way for their land? I'm not sure if it can touch stuff. No, it didn't. But <laughs> but but why couldn't he have? Um, I guess he could have if he wanted to. What, what do you think, Masson? So the tricky thing is with this is that Texas applies something called the absolute necessity doctrine. You see this in some of the later cases. Texas courts are hesitant to ever imply an easement by necessity. Why is that, Patrick? Why is this such a big deal? Why are they hesitant to? Yeah, well, why is it a big deal to imply an easement by necessity? Why is that something that a court, especially perhaps in Texas, would not want to do? It's a big, it's a big deal. It, yeah, yeah. Landa, what do you think? You're taking away one of their sticks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfectly stated. You're taking away one of their sticks. If I own a piece of property in Fee Simple, right? I'm Mr. Rosier. I own my 16 acres in Fee Simple. That's the gold sand. I can sell that, alienate, do whatever I want with it. Now, I don't have that anymore. I have this stupid easement. <coughs> I have less than Fee Simple. This easement is then transferred to this other guy. So now if I ever want to sell this land, I have to make sure that the uh, buyer knows about this other guy crossing it. If I ever want to flood this land because my crops are not doing well, I can't because I have to worry about him. An easement is a significant burden. That's not a good thing. Courts don't want to imply it. Um, Iman, is he getting paid for this easement? No. There's no payment. So not only is he giving up one of his sticks, he's not getting any compensation for it. So courts don't like doing this because it's a very, very um, uh, big deal. Uh, uh, Sarah? What else could um, the court have asked Mr. Avin to do instead of implying this easement? What, what other options were there? Yeah, and that was the question I posed to Sean a minute ago. Why couldn't the court say, have you tried to purchase an easement going through this guy's <laughs> land, or are you going through this guy's land? It could be done. In fact, I think the, the, the facts of the case said that um, some of the people in land to the north and south were actually um, sympathetic to Odin that he got landlocked. So maybe they actually gave him a right of way. So there are a lot of other ways to get to this road without having to cross over this guy's land. You go north, you go south, do whatever you want. But courts don't like having to apply this. Yes, ma'am. Right, and, and part of it, we don't have the full record, but we'll assume that at this point, he'll no longer own north or south. That's why I said assume the green, he'll doesn't own. Does that make sense? We don't know that, but that's, that's, what I, that's what I infer from the facts. Because if Hill didn't own north or south, the only way he could get to here was by crossing over this land. Because that was a transaction issue. And also, I think it was a fact that there was a, a path that had been there for some time, and that was the most commonly used path. So if he was going to reserve an easement, it would be here and not like here or there. It would be over the path that had been in existence. Sir, you handle that? Yeah, you just answered part of it. But Good. That 16 acres came last. So the <coughs> fact that he was taking that route all this time, when the other person came to buy the land, should they have known that there's a guy going across? Well, that goes to the prescription, prescri uh, prescri uh, the prescription claim, right? We'll do that in like in one minute, okay? okay. I promise. <laughs> well, that, that's the very next topic. So, everyone okay with this? So, the Texas courts say it's got to be absolutely necessary. And, and I think based on the, um, on, on the facts here, they're, they're, they're probably thinking it's not necessary. Because this is something called the, uh, the English rule, uh, which uh, Texans probably don't like calling something English, but uh, we, we have this in our state. 
So let's turn now to the, the question Iman just asked about, the prescription claim. Um, Akela, for many years, Aden had been crossing this land, right? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ashley, for many years, Aden had been crossing this land, right? Why was there not a claim for prescriptive easement? Right. So ever remember the elements of adverse possession? Here. They're, they're, they're basically the same for um, prescriptive easement. Uh, Sean, what, what's, what are the elements, if you, if you recall? Good. Okay, what else? What's, 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 what's a big one? Oh, come on. Uh, you got one. Okay, tell me what's another one. Continuous, good. What else? Hostile, good. What's the last one? Uh, Bradford, you got it? No. Anyone remember the last one? Claim of right. You guys got to. <laughs> your problem is you have to know this eventually. <laughs> okay. So the elements for prescriptive easement are basically the same as adverse possession. The biggest difference is the continuous part. Does it require, okay, so when we talked about Bradford, when we talked about average possession, remember we did the example of um, like a summer home. That say you are on a piece of land every summer for, you know, 10 years, but you're not there during the winter because during the winter it's really, you know, too cold. Can you get a claim for average possession? Yes, because you're using the summer home as it would be used. Right. So, adver and, and instead of saying using, say living. Living. Yeah, thank you. So, with, it's important. So, with adverse possession, you have to live on the land in the manner in which that land is usually lived on. So, if it's a summer home, you're only expected to live there in the summer. If it's a ski, ski cabin, you're only expected to live there in the winter. But that is sufficient. Prescription is the same thing. You have to use the land in the manner in which that land should be used. The key is use. Use, asterisk, we know it's, it's, it's important. Does it, any of you guys speak emoji or actually follow that? Anyone know what that is? Emoji. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a symbol of, 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 of glyphs, of, of, uh, of pictorial characters. It's actually from a Japanese texting. You can actually use entire uh, sentences. Actually, Google this. Someone actually wrote a, someone translated Moby Dick, the novel, into emoji, and it's purely with characters. <laughs> What's that? Let me find this one. Um, uh, yeah, emoji dick. So, for example, this is call me Ishmael. This this string of characters is call me Ishmael. Call me Ishmael. Don't worry about it. It's Ishmael. <laughs> anyway, I don't remember how I got on this topic. So, um, anyway, so it's based on how you use the land, right? So if we're talking about a road, in order to gain prescriptive easement, you have to cross the road. If we're talking about a pond that you water your chickens in, you have to take your chickens to the pond to be watered. The prescriptive easement is very specific. It's based on exactly what you're doing. So, um, uh, uh, Andrew, say for example that for 10 years, Mr. Othin was crossing the road by foot or horseback, right? And then all of a sudden he bought a fancy new car, right? Could he use his car on that road? <clears throat> yeah, say he had walked on it by horseback you know, for, for, for 10 years and he gained prescriptive easement. Then he bought a car. Could he use his car on that road? What do you think, Steve? I think he could. Why? Why? <laughs> oh, I, I, I always have the why handy, I promise. I know. Uh, so I think that he could because, I mean, he's been, he's been traveling the road for all that time. And I sounded skeptical to his answer. And he sounded skeptical to his answer. Double advocate doesn't work. So I think the answer is probably no. <laughs> he could not use the car. 
because it has to be based on a specific manner. And why? It goes back to what Landon said. This is taking away a stick. There's a big difference between letting someone cross your land by foot and crossing land by car, especially if it's muddy, there's going to be dirt, you know, erosion, I don't know, stuff that happens on a farm when things are muddy, bad stuff. So it has to be very precise. So when you're establishing a prescriptive easement, you need to make sure that you're using it in a specific manner. There's also the issue of exclusivity. Um, uh, Ajante? So when we talk about adverse possession, we usually say that um, the, the, the land has to be occupied by one person over the <coughs> university for, say, 10 years, right? If there's someone else living on the land, they can't get a claim for adverse possession, right? Will that work for a road? Does a person who wants to have a prescriptive easement to a road have to keep everyone off? Why? But how is it open and notorious if other people are using it? What do you, what do you think, uh, Kelly? Trent, what do you think? I don't know. Okay. I'll just say it. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why you would. Uh... Well, we'll think about it very carefully. It's a difference between living on the land and using it. When you are getting a prescriptive easement, all you're gaining is the right to use the land in a very particular way. It's to walk across it. That doesn't require you to exclude anyone else. When we talk about ownership and fee simple, the most important stick is the right to exclude. I am living on it so no one else can. With a road, that doesn't need to be the case because I'm walking here and you're walking next to me. And we're both able to walk just fine. So exclusivity is not a requirement for prescriptive easements. You don't need to have exclusivity. So it's possible that several people can have a prescriptive easement at once. It's even possible that groups of people stay in association, says, you know what, our members cross this land every day for a decade, we are gaining a prescriptive easement for our association. That's possible. That was kind of the issue in the, uh, in the Jersey Beach case we're going to do in a couple minutes. Okay? Everyone with me so far? So, um, Matt, was what was the problem, though, with prescriptive easement in this case? Um, the, the easier problem. Uh, <coughs> no. Well, let, let, look at the four elements, right? Which one? Which one was lacking? Why? Say that differently. Good. The use was permissive. If someone allows you onto their land, it's with permission. If that's permission, it's not hostile. Um, uh, Rose, what do we call that when someone allows you onto their land to, to cross? What would we call that? Good. Good license. And uh, Tracy, is a license revocable? Yes. Unless, mini review. Good. And generally speaking, it's when you spend money on it, if you invested or improved the land. Is there any reliance interest in this case? Did he put any money into it? Uh, Kelsey, was there was any reliance interest here? Uh, I don't think so. No, there wasn't. Okay. So the, the average possession, I'm sorry, the prescriptive easement claim fails. Okay? The court also makes a note of saying that, uh, the, that the use wasn't exclusive. Um, that, that's probably a minority rule. Generally speaking, you don't have to have <laughs> exclusive use to get prescriptive easement. And that, I'm not even sure if that's even correct statement of Texas law today, but that's, that's definitely the minority rule. Okay. So poor Mr. Othin, what's he to do, um, uh, Karen? What's Mr. Othin to do? He's uh, he's stuck here. 
What, what's he supposed to do? Right. Well, we'll say you know he he offers to buy land from the guy to the north. Says no. Offers to buy land to the guy to the south. Says no. He even offers to buy land to the guy to the east. He says no. No one will give him this land. What does he do? What happens then? Yeah. At that point, he would be so screwed he can't do anything else, and he would actually need to claim an absolute easement by necessity, saying, "Your Honor." No one else is home in this land. I am landlocked. I couldn't even get to court. You know, I, 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 I had to trespass to get to court, right? Because you can't, you can't leave his land. So let me ask another question. An easement by necessity, though, uh, uh, so now, Susan, an easement by necessity lasts how long? As long as it's necessary. What happens when it's no longer necessary? Poof, vanishes. So say, for example, that one day, right, Razier sold his land to someone else, this piece of land right here. And the other guy said, yeah, come on by. You can cross whenever you want. I'll give you a license. In that case, Allison, what would happen to the to, uh, an implied easement by necessity? It disappeared. So the implied easement by necessity is only necessary until. So when Landon said it's taking away a stick, it's not a permanent stick, though. Because once the knee is no longer there, the stick returns to the original owner. He, he, he regains his fee simple. Okay, everyone, everyone get that so far? Yes, sir. I still want to ask. I'm still on this, you know, horse to car view. Sure. Because I, I just, it seems to me that like you have this man who's going over the land with a horse, and all of a sudden he's blessed with, you know, an oil well that gives him a car. Yeah. And <laughs> well, but, but, but he doesn't. I mean, but he still has to get there. I mean, and he, just because his means have changed, he hasn't changed. His, well, I mean, is is there a difference? And people who live on a farm, I know, between allowing a horse to cross a piece of land and allowing a car to cross a piece of land, Chris. Well, in this case, he was still able to cross when it was all muddy, the horse, but not the car, so he was still able to get the use of different. But would there be any, any damage to the land between an automobile driving over it every day and a horse driving over it every day? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Is, is it like, I'm guessing the car makes a lot I mean, of impact on it. Yeah. Like <laughs> they need like a hovercraft, like they need a hoverboard to zoom, and then there'd be no problems. See, is, there a, is there a trespass with a hoverboard? <laughs> Air displacement is not is not a particular matter. And oh, no no no, there's no air. It's magnetism. There's no air being displaced. Magnetic force. No, it's a zoom. Stephanie, ask a relevant question. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. If you would have put down the gravel and stuff and made some improvements, you probably could have claimed that uh, the license cannot be revoked. And you could have actually had an implied easement there. But this being Texas in 1950, probably not. I'm, I'm guessing not, because Texas is very strict about these kinds of things. So one last thing. Yes, sir. Okay, so if, and this is your opinion, I, so if, if, uh, if you took a horse and buggy every day and then got a car, would that change your, your mind since it was... Remind me, we're going to do this in a couple of weeks where we construe things. There's an example. I don't ever hear the no vehicles in the park example. Where have you heard that? Okay. So, so Steve, if I put up a sign that says no vehicles in the park, what does that mean? <coughs> that means I can probably take my bicycle. In my Is a bicycle a vehicle? Well, what about a scooter? What about a scooter? Sign just says no vehicles in the park. That's all we have. What about a scooter? Uh, a motor powered, powered scooter? No, little razors. <laughs> I'd say We're going to come back to this in a little bit. I'm going to call on you for this exact question, I promise, okay? <laughs> We're going to do some statutory interpretation, okay? All right, good. All right. Uh, where was I at? I don't remember. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so off we go. So uh, a brief brief history. So, so 40 years after this case happened, um, Alton's daughter bumps into Juanita uh, Razier at a cotton gin. I think I know what that is. 
Uh, Eli Whitney, I know, is something. And they fell into each other's arms and they embraced and they made up, saying, "Let's let's end this bitter family feud. Let's this, there, there's no point having this kind of bitterness. Let's let bygones be bygones." Okay. Eventually, in 1988, they tore down the the Othen house because it became a fire hazard. Right. At that point, any kind of implied easement died because no one no one lived there anymore. Uh, any questions on that case? It's kind of a kind of a funny case, especially here in Texas. <coughs> so, da, 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 okay. So there are various degrees of necessary, and different courts have it. Uh, Texas is what we would call strictly necessary. That means unless there's a absolutely no conceivable other way to get to this land, we're not going to we're not going to find easement. So the book has one example that uh, this guy said, "Listen." Let me cross this land. If you don't, I'm going to have to build a $700,000 bridge down a cliff. And the court said, well, build the $700,000 bridge on the cliff. At that point, couldn't they just invade the guy by a helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> You're not joking. I mean, there are actually cases where courts said, well, couldn't you cross that lake by boat instead of having to walk around the grass? Or couldn't you fly? I mean, if you take strictly necessary to mean strictly necessary, then yeah, buy a helicopter. Tell Mr. Othin to... Uh, to, to use his, his, co his uh, cotton cash crops to, uh, to, to get a chopper. Uh, yeah, Arnold. So other courts, and probably what I say was the majority rule, uh, is it, something called um, reasonably uh, necessary, which is exactly what it sounds like, reasonably necessary. They're not going to make you buy a helicopter. They're not going to make you buy a boat. They might say, well, why don't you try to buy a piece of land to the north or south? Maybe someone else will give you that easement. But if no one will, then they'll give it to you. It's a more permissive standard. Um, <clears throat> people aren't quite that strict. So let's, let's do that example from the book, um, uh, Winfield. So this is example number two, uh, or question number two. It's on page 793, please. And you can take a minute to read it, and I'll call on you soon. Okay, so we, we have a series of transactions, right? Originally, A owns lots one through five, okay? Then A purchases one, two, three, four, five, okay? Lot five has no public access. Is that a problem initially after A owns everything? Why? Right, you can't trespass on yourself. So A owned all these, not really a problem. But let's take a step back, right? Um, so, uh, Roberto. So let's say that A purchases one, right? Then A purchases two. Then A purchases three. At the time A purchases four, what happens? Uh, but what happens? Right when someone sells number four to A, and what happens? Yes. So I'm O, right? I'm selling this land. I sell, I sell one. I sell two. I sell three, right? I'm about to sell four. I own five. But I'm about to sell four. What happens right when I sell four? What would I not do to myself if I'm O and I own five? What would I not do to myself? Right. Right. So once O sells four, he's going to say, listen, I'm not going to landlock myself, so I'm going to reserve an easement. Probably across four, but it could be across probably the only ones. But it's probably across four because it's the last one in time. So O is reserving an easement for himself from five to four. Okay? But then, Chris, what happens when A purchases five in the next transaction? What happens to that easement? It what? What happens to the easement once A purchases the fifth lot? Goes away. Randall, what do you think? Yeah, it goes away. So now what he has to do is now get an easement. Right. So there was an implied easement right after the purchase of four. But once A owns five, he owns everything. He has fee simple to everything. He doesn't need any easements. The 
the implied isn't vanishes. It, it goes poof in the air. Okay? So A dies and tests it, as people always do in this class. We'll never have wills. And he has five children, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay? So B gets one, C gets two, D gets three, E gets four, and poor little F gets F with five. <laughs> so Peter, what happens to when F sues one through four as a ham landlock? What would a court do? Is there any implied easements? <clears throat> but what about the easement that existed here when, when, when A purchased four? What happens to that easement? Where did it go? Poof, yeah. It went poof. <laughs> exactly. Because once A owns fee simple for the entire thing, the easement goes poof. So how will how will F get out of this landlocked spot? What would he have to assert? Can he assert any kind of implied easement based on continuous use? Yeah, well, but Blake, Blake, what do you think? Could how, how would how would F get out of this landlocked spot? What would you have to what would you have to prove? Good. What else could you argue? Probably the better argument. Yeah, yeah. Even a Texas court will say, okay, this this guy's locked. He can't go anywhere. He he is done. Uh, uh, you're probably not going to find many pieces of property that look like this. Um, uh, this actually happens. I mean, does anyone know about Chechnya? It's actually a region in Russia that's a, a quasi-autonomous country, but it's totally landlocked. And having a landlocked country with another country is very bad because they can't come and go as they please. Um, it's a really weird geographic situation. But imagine living here on F, and you can't go anywhere without permission. So the court will probably imply an easement uh, somewhere, okay, by necessity. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. If F was off on the east coast somewhere and you know just inherited this land, it doesn't have any necessity, right? I mean, it's just less uh, worth. You need to go to court to ask for it. It doesn't happen automatically. He doesn't have a house there or anything. I mean, he could sell it to one of his siblings. It's just it's worth less. Right. Right. I mean. In order for an easement by necessity to be implied, he'd have to go to court and ask for it. And you have to show a court, Your Honor, I live on this land, I need to cross it. So, I mean, if, if, if he never lives there, yeah, then no you'd have a hard time making the case. Um, but if he didn't live there, he probably wouldn't sue for it. Right? Maybe. I don't know. These brothers and sisters hate each other, so it always happens. Okay. Mm. Yeah, the book had a couple interesting examples. Oh, yes, ma'am. <coughs> From whom? From whomever. Let's just say that four other people own one, two, three, and four, and he decided to buy five. Would that make any difference to the court that he was just Well, to... who did he buy five from? That would matter. Because perhaps when five purchased the land, he might have reserved the easement for himself. Because this goes back to the original example. When A originally purchased five, there was already an applied easement on it. Right? That easement went poof because A owned everything. But say, you know, Z bought lot five. Z would then have the easement to cross over four. Everyone get that? It's a very good question. In the initial example, A bought all five of them, right? Right after the fourth lot, there would be a reserved easement to cross. Say instead of five going to A, five went to Z. Z would have kept that implied easement. And that implied easement would then transfer to person X or person D or F or whoever. Everyone get that? Okay. Everyone good with that? Okay. Uh, there are a couple funny examples about golf balls. Anyone here a golfer? Is that, is that like a big thing about trying to retrieve your balls from somewhere else? I mean, are they that expensive? They have to get them, or you just let them go? They can be expensive. If you're bad, they go far, where you don't want to go. <laughs> right, so this was at the, the Bel Air Country Club right next to Conrad Hilton's house. I'm guessing they could probably afford to drop a couple balls. But courts have actually said that if you 
consistently go across to a person's land to pick up golf balls, you gain prescriptive easement. Uh, there was one Texas case from Dallas, which I'm pretty sure was not good law, but something that says an unintentional trespass is still a trespass. I don't know what an unintentional trespass is. Trespass doesn't have an intent element. So I wasn't quite sure what that was, but eh, whatever. Um, the book also accepts public, pres public prescriptive easements on, uh, on government land. I think I mentioned this earlier when we did adverse possession. At Rockefeller Center in New York City, there's a little <coughs> strip of land, or Rockefeller, uh, it's called Rockefeller Plaza, uh, that's a quasi-government piece of property. And for one day every year, usually Sunday in July, they shut down the road to make sure that no one would have a prescriptive easement. And at the time, someone said, how can someone live on a street in New York for the entire year, right? And I said, that's actually somewhat feasible. But now I will give you the full answer. It's not necessary to live on the land for an entire year. It's just necessary to cross the land for an entire year or 10 years or whatever it is. And it's very feasible in New York to cross the same street every day for that long. And because it's quasi-governmental, it's maybe private, maybe public, uh, I, think, I don't think New York City allows um, adverse possession against the government. So Rockefeller Center says, hey, listen, we have an ownership in the street. We're going to shut down one day a year so no one can claim continuity. That's how you have to do it in New York. Okay. Any questions about that? Anything? Okay. All right. Uh, any Jersey Shore fans? No? Oh, my Staten Island friend's not here today. Oh. <laughs> and last year I had one suit from New Jersey and she wasn't here on this day either. I swear it's a conspiracy to deprive me uh, of, my, of my comeuppance. Okay, so I, I've, I've said this before, but I'm from Staten Island, which is effectively New Jersey. Um, and I, I, was, I, was, I was quite smitten with this show when it first came out. Um, actually, a couple of them went to a uh, high school not nearby not too far from where I live, so th these are basically the people I grew up with, and, and it's it's not a caricature as much as you think. It's actually somewhat real. Uh, fortunately, I got out, I left, but th they didn't. So anyway, this quote from the from the case just made me laugh very much. So let's talk about let's talk about beach access. Uh, oh, where are we up to? Um, who did I call him last? Okay, so, uh, oh, right around, Matt. Okay. So, who owns the water, Matt? Is it free? <laughs> Is it water free? <coughs> no, no, I'm talking about the water. Who owns the water? Right, they this beautiful, clear Jersey water, which is neither beautiful nor clear. <laughs> What, how, what do we call that? Commons, right? It's in the commons. The water is not owned by any one person. It's held in the commons. We usually say the government holds it in trust for the people. That's how we usually say it. Beyond the water, though, it gets messy. So we have different zones, right? This is actually the, uh, the, the satellite image of the uh, beach club. This is actually the, the, uh, the beach club right here, okay? And this is the Atlantic portion. This little strip of sand here, about three feet, which is right near the tide line. Tiffany, who owns that little strip of land that's right near the tide line? Right, right, you know, right around, around here. Who owns that? No, no, no. The, the three feet right by the water. Well, we don't say the government owns it. What do we say? Who? Owns, what do we call that? Yes, we call it the public trust doctrine, right? Where the government holds this land in trust for the people. So we know the water is in the trust, and also there's basically a three-foot strip, you know, not very far, a three-foot strip right by the water. Okay? Yes, sir? Is that three-foot strip just for... Depending where the tide is, yeah. Well, okay, but that's just, I mean, over... over. <coughs> We that that exactly was the issue in the Texas Supreme Court case. What happens when the shoreline changes? And I promise to come back to that. Okay, and Justice Busby will do a much better job explaining it than I can. So we say that okay, this makes sense. If the water is held in public, right? People have to be able to go into the water, and in order to go into the water, you have to start on sand, right? So we say it's a three-foot strip right by the water. 
is public. Anyone can go there, because if you want to walk into the beach, you have to go from somewhere. But Maritza, how is a person supposed to get to the shore when there's all public? I'm sorry, louder? That can't be right. That we say that the beach is public, that, you know, New Jersey people have a right to sunbathe and generally enjoy recreational activities. How is someone supposed to get to the water if this is private property? There's about 400 feet of sand right here, dry sand. From Here's the main road. This is Raleigh Avenue. How is a person supposed to get from the main road, Raleigh Avenue, down to that special three feet of sand? But was it a trespass, Katie? Was it a trespass? Well, how is a person supposed to cross to the beach? I mean, wh what do we call that? Uh, so, uh, Mary? Yeah. Exactly. This little footpath, right? No, no, don't worry. It's, it's counterintuitive. But this footpath, which leads from Raleigh Avenue down to that three foot of sand, is basically an easement in favor of the government. Anyone from the public can cross that. Uh, Alec, does anyone dispute that easement, what we call the vertical easement to go from the street to, the, to that three foot strip of sand? Does anyone dispute that? Yeah. Right. So there's no problem. And, and no matter where you are, the public trust doctrine, you have to allow people the ability to cross over your land to get to the beach. Now, there might be different ways of reaching this. Say that you know, there's a public beach here, right, and a private beach here. It might not be necessary to allow someone to cross your private beach. It's not necessary. They can cross here a block away. But, but we're in New Jersey, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll forget property law for a minute. But generally speaking, if the court needs to imply an easement across a, a, a plot of sand, they can. What's at issue in this case, however, is not this vertical path. It's not the three-foot strip right by the water. It's everything in between. That is a key part, because that was privately owned. So, um, uh, David, what, what were the facts of this case? How did this, how did this, uh, did this, this case emerge? Right. Right. Okay. So good. So for many years, this had been a publicly accessible beach. There'd been no problem. Then around like '96, the Atlantis Beach Club said, "You know, what? we're going to make this private." Um, trying to keep out this. Uh, trust me on this one. <laughs> this is actually to give you to give you a sense of scale. Um, this is New Jersey. Um, sea, uh, Seaside Heights is right around here on the shore. Let me zoom out. And this is where um, the, the the case at issue is, and it's in the bottom corner of the state, uh, and it's all the way to the southern tip, almost by Cape May. And it's actually a very nice part of New Jersey. It's it's, it's quite far from the uh, Seaside Heights. But you can see a, a good zoom in of it right there. Okay, so they put up a sign that said, uh, uh, free public access ends here, membership available at the gate, and we'll charge you a lot of money. Okay, uh, Stephanie, did, did these people, these neighbors who had lived in this area for a long time want to pay all this money? No. Okay. Why couldn't they just cross here at, at the uh, public beach across the street? Well, they probably could have, but if they would have had to walk all the way around. Like like from like from here to here, yeah. right, right. So so <laughs> one of the weird things about this case is that there's a public beach next door. Um, there was no reason why this case had to come out the way it did. I think the court was trying to set some broader policy, but we'll put that aside for a minute. Forget about forget about this beach. Forget about the the Vita lease and all the other stuff. That none of that really matters. Okay. So what's at issue here is is is, is this 
patch of, of, of dry sand, OK? So um, Haley, what did, what did the trial court do in this case? Yeah, all they got, that's right, all they got was a three foot. They got that three foot strip. Can you do much on a beach if you can only stay within three feet of the shore? No. Um, where are you going to put you, I mean, if you lie out, if I lie like end to end on a towel, I'm like six feet. I couldn't fit in a three foot strip. I mean, if I lie horizontal, but then I'll get, you know, washed over the second. So basically, all a three foot strip allows you to do is to cross, go in the water, and leave. That's all you can do. You can't sit by the beach. You can't. Tan, no GTL, you can't. It violates the most fundamental New Jersey right of the right to sunbathe. So this is this has to be against public policy or something. I told you, don't worry about that. Yes, you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. They can they can go right here, you know, five feet over, but that's that's we're in New Jersey. Yeah, and so it's an additional block. Um, yeah, fist pumping, exactly. <laughs> the reason why they have this is they want to keep out those people from the beach. I mean, that, that's effectively why you have a private beach club. There's actually, um, on the Sci-Fi channel, I don't know if anyone what's it called, Sci-Fi now, uh, there, there was a Jersey Shore shark attack spoof, and the entire premise was that these people had built a private beach club to keep out the Jersey Shore people. That, that was the entire premise of the, the uh, it was like a, like a mock horror movie. So don't, forget about the private beach next to the public beach next door. So the, to the trial court said, listen, uh, you have actually a three foot strip, uh, but you can't charge a fee for that. But you can charge fees for like lifeguards and other services, okay? What did the appeals court do then, um, uh, Catherine? <laughs> Basically, yeah, saying they, they, that they have to get vertical access and then this three-foot strip, uh, but they have to provide free lifeguards, and the fees vary, okay? I found this article in the New York Times from uh, uh, 2004. So this was after the Court of Appeals case, and um, it, it's actually kind of funny. The, uh, the, the club's president and owner was irate. Uh, he said, uh, oops. He's incensed at both the ruling and the state imposed fees, saying they do not cover the club's property tax or the cost of operation, let alone if we profit. He's appealed the ruling to the Supreme Court. So, so Lily, what's, what's the problem here by allowing all these, you know, uh, uh, seaside people to, to trample upon your beach without getting paid for it? What, what's, what's, the, what's the problem here? Yeah, I mean, why do people purchase a private membership to a beach rather than going across the street to the public beach? Why? Hmm. What? You say because they're snooty. Yeah. <laughs> <I said> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to keep people out, right? To, to keep this out. Yeah, so they don't have to do fist pumping. Um, I'm, making, <laughs> I'm, I'm making somewhat light of it, but it's actually... Uh, uh, perhaps a more deeper problem that people might realize at first blush. We say in property that the most important right in the stick is the right to exclude, right? This is taking away that stick, isn't it? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you're saying that is private property. So it's telling people you cannot choose to exclude. A lot of the value in a private membership for a beach club is that you can exclude people. You can let some people and some people out. Okay? But I think what may have been lurking here to go to the snooty comment, um, Kylie, is what happens if they didn't simply sell the permit to anyone? You know, some places if you buy a permit, you can get in. Well, if this was kind of like a country club type deal where they had to approve certain people getting in, what happens then? And there's some discretion through the grant permits too. Like, like what, what if like, you know, Snooky came up saying, you know, I'm loaded, here's a thousand bucks, give me a permit. And they said, no, we don't like your kind. <laughs> uh, you know? She was arrested on the beach for being a nuisance. I mean, she was actually a nuisance. What, what do we make of that, Kylie? Mm -hmm. Okay. Muhammad, what happens if they said we don't want to exclude women to our club? We want to have men on the beach. We don't have to worry about these you know, ugly women on the, you know, running around there. You know, they're, 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 they're... 
But what about the right to exclude? Yeah, we don't we don't admit any Italian people to our club <laughs> when we get many members in Jersey. But this is really the issue it's underneath. We're talking about a public beach, something public that's in the public trust. To be able to exclude people and have that discretion, something that this court probably doesn't like. So the court says, listen, make it open to everyone equally, as long as they pay their fee. Okay. Just we'll, we'll get back to this when we do fair housing laws in a in a couple of weeks, whenever that is. Uh, where was I? So we but so that's the case. So uh, yeah. So eventually they appealed. Uh, they appealed to the Supreme Court of New Jersey. Uh, Matthew, what does the Supreme Court of New Jersey do with this case? Well, let, let, let's, let's, let's take it step by step. Does it say that you have the right to access a vertical, to go, to go from the street to the beach? Is that right there? OK. So that, that, part, that part's fairly easy. Sorry. Let me just scare you. That part's fairly easy. You go from the street down there. Um, Osra, does the court say that you have the right to this three-foot strip of sand right by the, right by the water? OK. So, but the, the hard part then, uh, Nikki, is this 400 feet plot of dry sand. How does the court approach that, that dry sand? Why? Well, they can get to the beach by this footpath. <coughs> the question is about this 400 feet strip of dry sand right there. Why should the private club have to give that up? Yeah, what are the what are those factors? Okay, good. Don't worry too much about the Matthews case, but 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 kind of what they're holding is um, Ali. Can can someone enjoy the beach with only that three foot strip? Um, well, it says in eight oh three that they can't limit the vertical horizon, uh, the vertical or horizon public access, and then goes on like that. So no, essentially you need to come back in eventually and rest yourself. Yeah, it says the activity of swimming must be accompanied by intermittent periods of rest and relaxation beyond the water's edge. So in other words, if I, I'm six foot tall and I lay my blanket right down this way, I'm trespassing. So they say it's not feasible to have to give everyone. Okay, so they say that you need that three feet is not enough, right? If three feet's not enough, I'm six foot tall, right? Is four hundred feet too much? Why four hundred feet? So is it the rule that you take everything? You, that you take everything from? Uh, oh, where do you start from? Where do you start measuring from? That's kind of so Sean, where do you start measuring from? Where, where do they start measuring this 400 feet from? Looking on this map, where do you think they start from? That's from the three foot line. Three, three foot line until where? The beach end. Well, the three foot line is where the beach ends here. Where do they measure up? Where do they stop? That's what I'm saying, where the sand ends up there, I guess. Right. So everyone see right around here where the sand starts giving room to shrubbery? That's generally the line where you start counting. Um, and we'll do this again when Justice Busby talks about the Texas case, but where the vegetation line, that's what it's usually called, that's generally the line where the public trust ends and the private property begins. So what the court basically says is the entire strip of land from the vegetation line down to the shore. All that becomes part of the public trust. Now, Sean, why couldn't they just say, all right, Three feet's not enough. What about 20 feet? Would that be enough? 50 feet? Well, it kind of seemed to me that it didn't want to be too It's a Jersey thing, yeah. That's right. 
what they basically did was they took the property, all 400 feet of this beachfront property, which make no mistake, this was expensive real estate. This is right in the southern tip of Jersey by Cape May. This was something they were charging hundreds of dollars a month for. This was expensive. But they basically said, you know what? The entire thing has to be open to the public. So how, so Madison, how can a private beach club exist in New Jersey anymore? Right, all they would have is their little building here past the vegetation line. The idea of a private beach in New Jersey is of dubious legality. And actually, I, I didn't know this at the time, but I've been to the Jersey Shore before. I remember having to pay like a $5 membership to get into some beach. I'm like, wow, that's annoying. I don't have to pay $5. But then if I realized this could have been like a $500 membership. This was actually, actually it might have been before this case was decided, so I don't know. But it, it was probably in the early 2000s. So the court said, all this land is not yours. Patrick, was there any compensation for this? So, why not? Wouldn't, wouldn't the, the, I mean, going back to the, the privacy of the beach, I mean, wouldn't the, the club be investing money in maintaining the, the beach? And yeah. Why it's, it's, you have to pay it because it's, it's a nicer part of the beach. Yeah. Will they, will they continue to pay to maintain the beach? No. No. The shore will get run down. If the private beach club can't charge a fee, they're going to stop maintaining it. Or they'll maintain it only as much as they're legally required to. But the question is, so Landon, are they getting compensated for taking away their, their, their exclusion stick in that bundle? Uh, not completely. Not completely? At all? Well, they, are, they're, they can then charge for the general maintenance and the trash kind of picking up. Right. So here are the fees. See, okay, so it's actually kind of funny, right? This is New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, right? So, read this carefully. Private beach open to the public. Say it again. Private beach open to the public. Only New Jersey can the South should be on a government website. That, 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 that's, a, that's a hyper, that's, that's inconsistent. Anyway. Yeah, it's oxymoron. How can, how can there be a private public beach? So, the daily pass is $3. Uh, a seasonal pass, which is you know for the entire summer, is uh, uh, seventy-five dollars. They want to charge what like seven hundred dollars for for the season. So now they've lost for every seasonal pass roughly six hundred dollars. And it's possible they might not even want to sell a daily pass. Perhaps they want to allow people on who are you know consistent customers, come back a lot, with friends and family. Jersey, you can't do that anymore. And they're required to put on lifeguards between nine and five. Uh, and all these other, all the other fees. So yeah, th this this is New Jersey, and the beach is right around. Actually, it's right there. I can't quite click on it. Yeah, so that's where it is. So the the court says the entirety of the land is there. That's not the majority doctrine, and it's kind of a, a bizarre case to say. Um, one issue I'll mention briefly is that there's some notion that this might actually be. Um, a taking a property by the government without compensation. That is usually when the government takes your property that to pay you for it. The, the, the trick here is that there was no law passed taking this property. Usually when the government wants to condemn a piece of property, they have to have an eminent domain proceeding. We'll talk about that later. That didn't happen here. Here, a court, construing the common law, issued an opinion that took away 400 feet of property that was very valuable. And there's some speculation that you can actually have a judicial take, that is the courts can take it. Um, the book mentions the Stop the Beach case, which was at the Supreme Court about two years ago, three years ago. Um, the book wrote that certiorari had been granted. The Supreme Court had a weird 4-4 decision that was split. They did not address the issue of judicial taking, uh, largely because Justice Stevens recused. And the reason why he recused was because he owned beach property in Florida that was subject to the similar development. And actually, uh, a friend of mine uh, was the one who tipped off the, uh, tipped off the press about that. So he... <laughs> He was responsible for, for breaking a 5-4 decision against property rights, so we'll take for that what it will. Uh, the dissent raises the point that I think we all agree with. Uh, go to the private beach, a public beach is right next door. Why do we have to do this? But I think the court was trying to hold a, a broader uh, uh, issue of property law. Okay? Any questions? Anything? All right, have a good weekend, guys. See you on Tuesday. Fine. <laughs>
You happy? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Good. Thank <laughs> you.